against a senator. Also, the coral crisis off Canada's east coast. Killing coral off Canada's east coast. Is an environmental crisis lurking off Nova Scotia? The decline of underwater coral is fueling problems between some Nova Scotia fishers and the Department of Fisheries. The fishers say the coral is steadily dying off, and that's hurting fish stocks. The government says there is no reason to suspect a connection between coral and the surrounding ecology. CTV's Ben Chen has more. Nova Scotians who've had a rocky ride with traditional fisheries now believe they have found a possible clue to the dwindling stocks. Dead coral in all shapes and sizes and in brilliant tropical colors. This is why we had so many fish. Derek Jones was a fisherman. Now he's an environmentalist. That's because he's caught more dead coral than fish in the last two years. And he believes that's no coincidence. There's a direct relationship between the ground fish and the coral forest. Some American research supports that view. Roger. This underwater video comes from just off the coast of neighboring New England. It shows cold water coral teeming with life. It's no wonder, says Richard Atwood, the fishing was always best off Cape Sable Island near coral. As you stop and think about it, it was like a protection for the smaller fish. And Atwood says he remembers who killed much of that habitat. I'd say the foreign fleet at the time then. Giant foreign fishing vessels that dragged the ocean floor in the 50s, 60s, and 70s before Canada declared a 200-mile limit. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans, though, isn't convinced. It was that's anecdotal information, and we just have no way to, to substantiate that. But the DFO admits they have done no research into Nova Scotia coral. Derek Jones thinks that's a mistake. Well, the end result will be a dead ocean. He says coral is still being destroyed, and its importance to the ocean habitat isn't known. Ben Chen, CTV News, Cape Sable Island. And when we come back, a deep sea treasure off Canada's east coast. How fishermen there are pointing scientists in the direction of some rare cold water coral. But first, scientists are starting to learn something that fishermen on Canada's east coast have known for a while. There's coral in our seas. It's something you'd expect to find in warm tropical waters. But if you travel far enough from the shores of Nova Scotia and drop a line deep into an underwater canyon, you might just bring up a rare specimen or two and then do something to protect them. It's one of the most beautiful sights in the world. That's why so many of us choose to spend our vacations, or at least long to, where the fish swim among the colorful coral reefs of the tropics. Sanford Atwood has never been to the tropics. He's never gone snorkeling or scuba diving. What he knows about coral is what he's seen on TV. Unless, of course, you're talking about this coral, the coral he collects right in his ocean backyard off the southernmost tip of Nova Scotia. I saw coral back when I was very young and my dad used to bring it home all the time, you know, like uh, show us what it was and we used to ask, you know, as a kid, what is this? And he'd say, a tree, you know, a petrified tree. Like Sanford, his father was a fisherman. He brought the coral up on his hooks from a depth of 200 meters or more. In this worn photo of him from the 1950s, he proudly displays a recent catch. That was 40 years ago. Today, most Canadians, most Nova Scotians, still haven't heard of Canadian coral. Even Dalhousie University biologist, Dr. Martin Willison, only found out about it recently. Basically, I was amazed, and I was a little disbelieving at first, because corals are tropical organisms. Uh, here we are with very cold water uh, off Nova Scotia, generally temperatures somewhere between, let's say, three or four degrees and eight or ten even degrees. But certainly the lower water is generally quite cold. And I felt that there shouldn't be corals here. This was just a prejudice about the way they are. This is a specimen of 
Paragorgia arborea. It's one of Nova Scotia's deep water corals. This is the largest of the deep water corals that we find in our area. As you can see, it has a tree-like structure, and um, the name arborea refers to this tree-like structure. It's highly branched, and the branches are like this because the tree essentially is facing the current, and as it faces the current, it filters out the organisms, or the bits of organisms, the little stuff in the water that it's able to eat. This specimen was given to me by a fisherman from southern Nova Scotia, and it was the largest one that he'd seen. He'd come across, and the, therefore he kept it, and it rattled around in his garage for about 12 years, and then he passed it on to me. Willison readily admits he wouldn't know anything about Canadian coral if it weren't for these two fishermen, Sanford Atwood and Derek Jones. Well, we can find coral just a few meters from here, like some of the soft coral, or we call them strawberries. You know, they look like anemones, but they're actually a species of northern soft coral. And then out of little ways, you get little bamboo-type corals. In the little deeper water, you get brain corals, and then the sea fans, and then the hard corals. I mean, you got a wide variety of coral here. That's quite an extraordinary specimen. Unless you meet up with Atwood and Jones, chances are you'll never see any coral from Canada. It takes Sanford 12 hours by boat to get to where the coral is at his fishing grounds. Hi, this is the Silver Eagle reporting now. Destination is Boise. I'll be gone for four days. It's 200 to 600 meters down, too deep for diving, so there's hardly any underwater footage. This was shot from a Department of Fisheries submersible in an area called the Gully off Sable Island, at 300 meters and at nearly 400 meters. Reports from fishers indicate that the Hell's Kitchen area in the gully is one of the most prolific sites for coral off Nova Scotia. There's much better footage from the United States, taken by the National Undersea Research Center of the University of Connecticut at the Lydonia Canyon on the American side of Sable Island. This is spectacular. There must be 200 shrimp on this uh, soft coral. Okay, we're passing a real large cluster of soft corals. Boy, oh, that's as spectacular as the Caribbean. More so. In the U.S., there's been some research on coral. Some Nova Scotians, like Mark Butler of the Ecology Action Center in Halifax, think it's about time we started finding out more about it as well. I think scientists and have really recognized the value of, of, of fishermen's uh, information. Heather Breeze did the first Canadian study on coral, and she started by interviewing dozens of fishermen. What, what they told me is it, was that they, they found coral when they fished in certain spots. Um, they found it when, when they fished in, in deep channels between fishing banks or in, in submarine canyons. And the, the names that the fishermen ga give corals um, are very descriptive and... and uh, there, there's one particular coral, which is, you can probably see in the, back, the background here, which is called bubblegum coral, and that's because it's bright pink and it's, it's kind of spongy in, the, in texture, I guess, kind of like the texture of bubblegum. And according to Breeze, people are interested in knowing more. I think it has inspired people to do more research. I've heard of a couple students at Dalhousie who are looking at corals and other deep-sea invertebrates. And I, th I think um, institutions like the Bedford Institute in Oceanography, of Oceanography and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans are becoming more, more interested in invertebrates, too. And how will they find these compared to corals from the tropics? Canadian corals are very similar to tropical corals. They're, they're related to tropical corals. They belong to the same families and, in some cases, the same genera as tropical corals. That is, they're close relatives of the tropical corals. The major difference between the Canadian corals and the tropical corals is that in the tropics, the corals grow near the surface of the water, and most of them have photosynthetic organisms associated with them. These are called zooxanthellae, and the zooxanthellae take energy from sunlight and allow the corals to live off the energy that comes from the sunlight. Our corals are at much greater depths. 
They're currently found at 200 meters below the surface and more, and therefore they're living in completely dark conditions. Therefore, they are not in a position to take any advantage of light. And they're filter-feeding organisms, that is, they scavenge little pieces that, of, of living material, or, de or dead material that's floating past, they were once living material, and they filter these out um, of the water and live off, off, off that. And this is a, it's a hard life to do that, so they grow very slowly. No one knows how much coral is growing off the coast here, but the fishermen know where there are corals, there are fish. They believe corals provide habitat fish need to survive, and they say the coral here is being destroyed by draggers and their nets. It plays a big role because every time you haul a piece from bottom, you always see, always see life form on it. Shrimp, different types of fish, little tiny fish, just so we can see them. Only way you see them is, you know, some will hang right on. You know, even haul them up from like two, three hundred fathoms. You see those little tiny cr creatures hanging on. So it must mean something. We have to use some common sense. We have now uh, video footage showing that uh, fish live amongst corals. We know from fishermen that fishermen fish where there's corals because there's fish there. So that's a fairly good uh, uh, hint that, that, that there's some there's some connection. Um, and, uh, but of course these things, you know, if we wait until there's absolute proof that, uh, that corals are an important part of the ocean ecosystem, then there probably won't be any corals left. Hook and line fishermen Atwood and Jones are so concerned they've founded the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society. They take their message and their display on the road every chance they get. They want everyone to know about Canadian coral. They want the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to protect coral areas from extensive fishing and gas and oil exploration until more is known about their role in the marine ecosystem. Dr. Martin Willison is a convert. There's no question that corals are coming up from the bottom um, in large quantities in fishing nets and uh, in lesser quantities uh, um, in association with hook and line fishing. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the amount of coral destruction that's associated with bottom dragging, that is with um, trawling along the bottom, which is probably the most destructive of the uh, activities that we, we do in the oceans. Dr. Willison believes that some coral areas should be protected so that scientists can study them. To gain support for coral protection, he's making room for Canadian corals in this year's biology class. This is a specimen of Primnoa recidiformis, which is the same species as we saw previously, except in this case, at the base of the specimen, we have a second species, Paramuracea, uh, which the local fishermen call black coral. And you can see very nicely on the black coral the individual polyps. These are little sea anemones, and each of those is the individual coral organism. For years in Atlantic Canada's fishing community, they were a mystery. Strange looking things like pieces of a tree were caught up in nets or hauled up on the end of a hook. It turns out they were part of Canada's coral forest, a forest which provides food and shelter for dozens of species of fish. Well, we know a lot more about them now and their destruction, thanks to one Nova Scotia fisherman. Marie Thompson has his story. A coral forest. Not in the Caribbean. This is the North Atlantic. It's cold, dark, and deep, but not deep enough to be safe. In the waters off Norway, this reef is dead. It looks as if it's been bulldozed. That's because it was. There has been a large amount of trawling, and at 200 meters depth, most of the corals have been destroyed. Trawlers or draggers. Fishing boats with big scoop nets that drag along the ocean floor. They're very efficient at catching fish and very good at mowing down coral. Is this happening in Canadian waters? 
A Nova Scotia fisherman, Sanford Atwood, believes that it is. They kept saying the fisheries is going, you know, there's a crisis in the fisheries. And I kept telling them why the crisis was. It was destroying the habitat. Coral are living creatures. They're ideal breeding grounds for fish and other species. We know all about them in warm southern waters, but next to nothing about cold water Canadian corals. Thanks to Sanford Atwood, that's about to change. On a fine day in August, Atwood heads out to sea from Clark's Harbor, Nova Scotia. He's going fishing, not with hooks, but with a camera. He's hunting for coral. Sanford Atwood thinks he knows where to find it. It's part of the fishing lore around here. His passengers today, a unique alliance of fishers and university scientists with lots of questions. It's called strawberry bottom, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People call it strawberries. And is there anything, is there anything that you'd find in, on strawberry bottom? Like, is there anything that'd be good for, for fishing? Haddock. Yeah, it's really good for haddock, Really good. Really good prime bottom for haddock. Oh, well, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They're doing what scientists and fishers rarely do. They're cooperating, working together to put an end to what they call deep sea clear cutting of an old growth forest. So we'll have uh, good quality video, digital yeah. images this time. Yeah. Sanford Atwood is not a draggerman. He fishes with hooks on long lines. Those hooks occasionally snag these strange looking branches of coral, and that's what got him curious. If his lines can break them, what do the dragnets do? He started asking questions, but got few answers. I actually took a piece in the 80s, as how so concerned I was, to my local DFO office, put it down on a desk and told them, like, the draggers are destroying it, do you know it? Oh yeah, we know they're there. It's an attitude that makes Sanford frustrated and angry. For years, he's alone in his quest. Eric? Yes? Yeah, I got another piece of coral I pulled up this trap. Yes, I'm up here. Yep. There's a big piece. Sanford's not alone in his crusade anymore. He's been joined by his friend Derek Jones, another hook and line fisherman obsessed with corals. It's because they're so uh, much a part of the Canadian Ocean. They're a foundation species that our ocean has relied on for years, and the knowledge of them is being lost. Yeah. Where'd you get it? Just so after Romy's Peak uh, on the other side of the cove. Derek Jones and Sanford Atwood put together a display of their corals, collected from the nets of draggers and off their own hooks. They travel to schools with it. And it attracts the attention of another kind of educator, Dalhousie University ecologist Martin Willison. And I'd never heard of these deep sea corals before, and I thought, well, this is a really strange thing. And I expected them to be little things. And I was completely shocked when I realized how big they were. And then immediately it was just like a revelation. Well, of course, this is so important. He becomes a convert to the cause to save Canada's coral. Sanford invites Willison to hunt for corals with him, and he attracts two more colleagues from the university to come out on the boat today. A remote-controlled underwater camera sends live pictures back on board. Oh, look at that. Very nice. I can only get corals. <laughs> that's okay. You're pretty good at that. I only came with corals. Oh, that's superb. They call them strawberries because of their color. These are soft corals, 10 to 15 centimeters high, 35 meters down, full of life. Sanford Atwood's heard a dragger's been through here, but the tidal current runs strong in these waters. They only have a few hours to look. What's your depth on bottom here, Jim? We're at 113, 113. They're using borrowed equipment in shallow inshore waters, paying for their own fuel. But Atwood believes the real problem is in deeper waters. That's where the tall, harder corals live. 
They're more fragile than the small, soft ones. What's needed is a big ship and deep water equipment capable of plunging 200 meters or more down. By last summer, Sanford's little band of volunteers gets its message across. A fisheries research ship for the first time gets video of Canadian deep water coral standing tall off the ocean floor. What we've seen in the last few months is that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who at first, as has been described by Sanford and Derek, have first ignored this issue, are now turning around and actually going out and studying deep sea corals. And, uh, and, uh, and yet still, I think the fishermen are in the lead on this. No one knows how much coral's been destroyed, but no one disputes that it's happening. Not even draggermen. Uh, yes, some of our fleets have impacted them. Brian Giroux works full-time as a lobbyist for Nova Scotia's midshore dragger fleet. He says most of the damage was caused 20 years ago when there were lots of foreign draggers around. Up until the late 70s, early 80s, we had uh, hundreds of factory freezer trawlers fishing within miles of our coast, 12 miles of our coast at times. Uh, so most of the organisms that are in very shallow water, say shallow within 250 fathoms or so, have probably been impacted during that overexploitation of the foreign fleets. The foreign fleets are now gone. Giroux says the smaller Nova Scotia draggers are learning to stay away from the coral beds. But Sanford and Derek want more than that. They want the government to create special zones for coral. No fishing allowed. Martin Willison says it can only work if everyone plays by the rules. And uh, Sanford and Derek have proposed that there be a protected area for our deep sea coral forest off Nova Scotia, the, an area where the trees are particularly rich. And when it was proposed, I turned to Sanford and I said, Sanford, are you willing to not fish in there? And he said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I would leave that alone. But it's more important to get the draggermen on side. Already, evidence points to coral as an important nursery habitat for redfish, one of their big commercial catches. I'm willing to accept that evidence and, and, and uh, you know, to look at, at honestly and re straightforwardly trying to protect these areas. We've identified some of them uh, and we've got some preliminary discussions about some closures. Preliminary is the operating word. Even though some fishermen accept the need for action, the government now says it needs more time to study and map the coral. Sanford Atwood worries time is running out. He swears he'll never let the Canadian government off the hook. As long as I live. If I live to be 100, I'll still do it. Get after them. Because I got a grandchildren, I got a son growing up, and I want something there for them when they, when they could take the place of, of the fisheries. For Country Canada, I'm Marie Thompson. I'm Professor David Scott at the Center for Marine Geology at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, I generally have an interest in quaternary geology. I've never looked very much at coral. And my interest in deep sea coral came in 1995 when two fishermen called me one day and they said they had these buried forests in 300 meters of water and I'd never heard of anything like that. They, uh, I said, well, why don't you bring this up? Uh, to Halifax next time you come up. So Ralph Sanford Atwood and Ralph Atkinson came up to Halifax and they brought this piece of coral up, uh, which I'd never seen anything like it. I looked at it and I said, that's not a tree, that's a deep sea coral. And after that, I didn't know very much about deep sea coral. I started calling around to colleagues in the uh, Smithsonian Institution and over in Norway found out the deep sea corals were quite well known, but not very well known off Nova Scotia or off Canada, for that matter at all. And started looking around. We went down to Barrington Passage, 
where these fishermen were from, talk to those fishermen, because a lot of them had a very extensive knowledge of this coral. They'd been, in one case, Sanford Atwood's family had been fishing out there for almost 100 years and been bringing this coral up for a long time, but they'd always been told it was petrified wood. And we first got interested in Canadian corals when we would see them on the wharves as children, ask the fishermen what they were. They would say trees. You know, they were really quite beautiful. As amateur scientists and professional fishermen, we decided to study these creatures on our own, photograph them, document them the best way we can, and then eventually we were asked to go to schools to show the children that Canada has corals. My first involvement with coral was when my father, when I was a kid, my father brought it home. And I usually asked a lot of questions, you know, like, what is it, where did it come from? He said it was tree, petrified trees. So I kept believing it was petrified trees. And I believed that for years until the day I took a piece down to Dalhousie in Halifax and I met Dave Scott and presented the piece to him and he was very excited because he said it was coral and I was too when he told me it was coral. I mainly dominated this inshore grounds roughly you know two anywhere from two to twenty miles off and we noticed a lot lots and lots I'd get twenty or thirty a day of these little strawberry corals some bigger of little corals and on a rock, they'd unhook them on them and go back. And his head was all on flat bottom, which we call drag a bottom, because it's the same kind of gravelly bottom that haddock tend on. So this is where we fished them. And when we go and fish for these haddock, now there's no haddock, there's no strawberries. It's like a garden out there, they're ripping in, tearing it right to pieces. Nothing's going to survive. Our fishing's had it and it's going down big time if they continue dragging, right? For a number of years I've been working on, on fisheries issues and attending meetings and uh, fishermen would come in, uh, particularly hook and line fishermen, uh, really distraught at the, what they perceive a lot of damage being done to the ocean floor by dragging. In particular, of course, the, uh, what really spurred us was the work of the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society, the work that uh, Derek Jones was doing and, and Sanford Atwood. And, I mean, they had the specimens and they had them mount and, mounted and displayed. And in the fishing community, I must say that it's... Uh, it's not a big secret, or it's not only one or two individuals that knows about these corals. Anybody who's been fishing on the edge of the Scotian Shelf uh, knows about them. If you talk to American fishermen, oh yeah, they'll say, oh yeah, I know those trees. So um, within the, I mean, it's a kind of interesting because within one community, if you like, the fishing community, there's all kinds of knowledge about certain aspects of these corals. And yet we had scientists, say at DFO or at the, uh, at the university, who uh, didn't know of their existence in Canadian waters. So well, after a number of interviews with fishermen, both by ourselves and by the Ecology Action Center, the Ecology Action Center decided they would try to organize a conference on deep sea corals. And it turned out there was an incredible amount of interest, much more than I would have imagined. So that by the summer of 2000, we had participants from around 30 countries coming to Halifax for the first international conference on deep sea coral. Quite an amazing conference. Uh, I was amazed, at least, by the diversity of the corals and by what these corals look like in the deep sea. They look just like a shallow water coral reef, except you don't, you're below, way below the photic zone. On the continental shelves of Nova Scotia, we find coral forests. These are structurally complex. Imagine, they're, they're really like trees. Each of the individual coral colonies is like a tree, and there's many, many of these, they create a forest. And in this forest, among the trees of the forest, we find fish, we find invertebrate organisms such as basket stars. We find a whole complex of ocean organisms. And just as a forest provides, just as a forest of trees provides for richness on land, um, many, many niches for many kinds of organisms, so the trees of the continental shelf, the coral trees of the continental shelf, provide us with rich habitat for many organisms in the ocean. You know, imagine what happens well, I'm sure you're familiar with what happens if you cut down all of the trees in a forest. We have no places anymore for birds and so on. 
And the same happens in the bottom of the ocean. If we knock down all the trees, as happens with, as the coral trees, as the fishmen call them, as happens with uh, some kinds of fishing gear, for example, then we have no forest left and no place for these many, many kinds of organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean. One of the nice things about working with modern reef corals is that they're like environmental tape recorders. They grow like an onion or a, or a tree would be a better example. They add bands every year, and these bands are about a centimeter in thickness. So if you go back in time, if you wanted to find out uh, whether the sun was shining in April 1944, you can go back and you can do that with a reef coral. And we had no idea whether this was going to be possible with deep water corals. It turns out that it will be possible. It's going to be a, a heck of a lot harder with deep water corals than it is with reef corals. But we can determine centuries-long temperature records and centuries-long productivity records. But we need to get the samples. <clears throat> My colleague at uh, McMaster University, Mike Risk, and his associate Jody Smith were the ones that pioneered this technique on how to get the record out of these corals. And we're going to use, they have a minute drill, which can get at each one of these layers, which are only about 200 microns thick. So you need a very small drill to drill individual layers and get the record out of each one of these layers. And then we heard about these strange deep water corals in Norwegian fjords. That was beginning of the 90s. And so we rented a camera, lowered it, and there they are, these deep water reefs of unexpected dimension and structuring and rich in biodiversity. And we all are aware that climate change can occur not within thousands of years, but even within tens of years. Well, following the Coral Conference, this piqued a lot of interest with a lot of people, including some of the government agencies. Um, of course, we noticed when we were at the Coral Conference, there was a lot of video of other deep sea coral reefs, but there's none off Canada. So we had a sort of an inkling of what these should look like, but all we had were pieces of coral like this that the fishermen had brought us. We had no idea what this coral would look like in, a, in its forest, in its setting on the seafloor. So, but to do that, you need a submarine or a remotely operated vehicle. And these cost a lot of money to mobilize and a lot of money to get out here. And it took another year after that to actually get that money together, get the equipment together, and actually get out to look at these things. And the result is what you're going to see in a few minutes, in a few seconds, is deep sea video, the very first deep sea video taken of corals off eastern Canada. And you'll see an amazing diversity of corals. This diversity of corals that you'll be seeing in this video is occurring right in the front edge of the Scotian Slope, where you see the label of Northeast Gully, or Northeast Channel, with the two arrows, and it's right along that break at about 500 meters of water depth. And the currents here are extreme. The Bay of Fundy empties in and out of this channel, the Northeast Channel, has the highest tides in the world. And it actually prevented us from staying on the bottom very long because the ship would move the ship and the vehicle. But what you'll see is huge amounts of material in the water, and that's why these corals do so well here, is there's lots of particulate water material in the water that they can feed on. Well, we were finally successful in getting a ship that could handle a, a remotely operated vehicle, the Martha L. Black from the Quebec Division of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We had a staff uh, from Dalhousie University, Memorial University, McGill University, but I think most importantly we had a representative from the fishing industry, the guy who actually helped us find this stuff. We also had representatives from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the uh, Geological Survey of Canada. The vehicle we're using is called ROPOS. It's a remotely operated platform of ocean science run out of the Canadian Submersible Facility in Vancouver. It has many different kinds of sampling devices, which you'll see in this video. It has two 40-horse motors on the back, and the umbilical cord that you saw is what powers this vehicle and allows it to stay on the bottom much longer than manned submersibles might. Well, when we first got to the seafloor at 500 meters water depth, this is what we saw. The coral in the distance is about two meters high. It's called pink coral or paragorgia. Small corals in the foreground are peminoa, which are the ones that we were interested in because these are the ones that have the climate record. 
you see all the fish swimming around. The white coral is probably the same species as the pink one, we're not sure. And you can see several different kinds of coral living in the same place. And you see all the fish. This answered one of the first questions is, are these corals fish habitat? And you'll see throughout this video that fish are everywhere around these corals. As we get a little bit closer to the coral, you see this fish nestling in the coral, just like a bird in a tree. And this was a pretty common sight. The shrimp you see swimming around in the front, they seem to be attracted to light. Even though they never see light, they were attracted to it, and so were a lot of these fish. You might notice just the huge numbers of fish. When you went away from these coral, you just didn't see very many fish. Fish were also attracted to light. They may have seen light, they may go up to the surface, but certainly not often. There's a huge amount of sea life around these corals. There's at least two different kinds of corals that you see in the front. These are hard corals that have a hard calcium carbonate skeleton. This white coral you see here is sort of spongy, and there you see a fish. It gives you a good idea of the scale of this large Paragorgia. Looking at another coral, we see a sea urchin and a little tunicate hanging onto it there, and all the usual shrimp and associated other organisms. Here we see some individual corals. We see two different types of things, polyps of these hydrozoans. A little bit of a close-up, you can see them out. And here you see a really close-up, and then you see that one contract. As the vehicle approaches, you can see another large piece of Paragorgia coral. Again, probably two meters high almost. Polyps fully extended. This is often called bubblegum coral or strawberry coral because of its color. Uh, when it dries up, it looks much different than this. You see fish everywhere swimming out of it. Lots of shrimp in it. A uh, little needlefish swimming by here. Well, of course, we weren't just down here to take pictures. We also wanted to get some sampling. This is the clipper arm or sampling arm. There's two of these on this vehicle. It's able to go and clasp uh, small, large things, rocks. In this case, a piece of coral that we want, that we need to be able to do our climate records on the base of this coral. You see on this piece of coral, uh, the actual, the original living coral seems to be restricted only to the tips. Their soft coral hydrozones have taken over part of the skeleton. And this seemed to be a common phenomena is that when the uh, original coral would die, these original skeleton would be taken over by these other uh, animal forms. Still, the animal form or the skeleton still maintained, however, a uh, good living space for all the fish. What's going to happen now is we have to position the, the vehicle. Uh, there's a little bait box you'll see in the front. These, the top will open. and what we attempt to do then is stick the material into the bait box, close the top so that when we move the stuff stays, the specimens stay inside that uh, the bait box. Uh, it looks like it's going to get killed here but you can, you'll see how incredibly flexible this stuff is. Even though it's hard coral, it's still very flexible and this was still alive when we brought it back up to the surface. One of the major problems is getting it released, trying to get it untangled from the uh, tweezers. And then, of course, the lid closes down on it. Well, besides sampling living coral, we also wanted to sample dead coral because these sometimes were larger and contained much more of a climate record. You see here all these brittle stars all over the seafloor. They often were covering the seafloor when there wasn't very much coral around. Uh, this particular coral turned out to be one of our better ones because it was about an inch in diameter as opposed to half inch in diameter for most of the small living ones. As with the living ones, these have to go into the sample boxes because otherwise they'd just be lost from the current. One of the few limiting factors in the ropo staying on the bottom is when you fill up all these uh, boxes you want to be able to sample once they fill up you've got to bring it up and empty this thing out the other capability we have with this is 
being able to actually suction material off the corals. The biologists were very interested in finding out the associated fauna living on these corals, not just the fish, but shrimp, uh, sea urchins, other echinoderms, all kinds of different stuff. And one of the things we did, you can see that little hose to the right of the screen, is a suction hose. And what it does is suck stuff into those, those uh, canisters, which are all numbered. The reason we're looking at those was to get the numbers right. And as you see the camera panning down, you're going to see it pan down to the coral and to where the suction head is. You see the suction head is just about to be turned on. It's trying to get things like that little shrimp that tried to run out of the way. And we ended up getting quite a few, probably several different types of species, small invertebrates living on this coral. You can see everything, the one shrimp at the top, I think he managed to escape, but a lot of other things didn't manage to escape. So we got a pretty good assay of exactly what's living on these corals. We we're also interested in sucking up sediment. And we'll see in this clip, we actually put the head of the suction tube into the sediment and suck up the sediment around it. The seafloor here was largely a lag deposit. There was no real active sedimentation. So everything that was here is reworked. We wanted to see what kind of material was getting reworked and what kind of biologic remains were ending up in the sediment. So we sucked up a large amount of this stuff and put it in a, in a canister again and we're able to look at it. We look at it in different sieves. When this material sucks into these canisters, it sucks through different uh, mesh sizes. You can see we've got a, a big load of it here. When well, we moved over to a different site, you see mainly the boulder bottom, you see cod swimming around. This is because it's at nighttime, the cod seem to come down to the bottom. What you're looking at in the foreground there is a boulder that's been rolled over. This is not a natural process. It's almost certainly uh, been dragged. That's why you're not seeing very much coral. You see that coral actually growing up from underneath the boulder. So we move to another piece of coral or another part of the seafloor. There's a lot more coral and correspondingly a whole lot more fish. Uh, one thing you notice when you're out in the Bay of Fundy is tremendous amount of particles in the water. These coral need particles to eat. That's what they're eating. That's probably why they're so abundant here. And one of the few times we see some other associated sea anemones, and just up on the right of the screen, you see a cod. Uh, not something we commonly saw, nestled in the, in the coral just like the redfish have been doing throughout this entire video. Well, we did 13 separate dives with this cruise and with this vehicle and the week we were out there. Every time we had to bring it up, when we brought it up, we had to bring it up because the uh, sample containers were full. See, gently putting it on the deck. Um, and here we have part of the scientific staff looking at some of the corals. Uh, the Preminoa coral, which is a hard coral, and the Paragorgia, or the soft coral. This polyp's still out even though it's back on the surface. And even in daylight, it's even more spectacular than when we saw it actually undersea. Uh, Paul Mortensen was a coral expert from Norway, who's temporarily working for Department of Fisheries and Oceans, looking at one of the specimens he hopes to grow back in the lab. And these are some of the shrimp that we got off uh, one of the suctions from some of the strawberry corals. These are some uh, brittle stars that we brought up doing uh, surface surveys of their densities. On the stern of the ship, we're looking at uh, sediment. This is Sanford Atwood, the chief person on this cruise who showed us where all the coral were. We're going through the sediment here, sieving it to isolate some of the material. And here's students and postdocs looking at some of the coral we brought back. Well, one of the reasons we're doing this is because we're all interested in global warming. And is it really occurring? And if it is, how fast is it happening? And one of the big problems with determining all this is having a record that's accurate enough and high resolution enough from the ocean to see if what we're seeing now is something that's only happening now or it's happened on a yearly, on a 50 year time period, a 100 year, 200 year time period throughout the last 10,000 years. And the only way to get that is with these coral because these coral provide us that annual record that we've never had before. It's like having a paleo thermometer going back several thousand years into the geologic record. And it's the only way that we're going to find out exactly what's happening with global warming.